All right, everybody. I think we are good to get things rolling. We'll have a few more speakers coming in later on during the space. For now, I'm going to run through the panelists we got up here. Folks, once we get rolling, feel free to chime in at any time. The only request I have is that you leave microphones muted while one speaker is talking so we don't have to worry about any feedback. And when I call your name after your intro, please, please plug anything you got coming out, anything you're working on, anything you want the people to know about. More than happy to have you promote that up here. Let some people get in there and learn from you folks. So I'll start us off with some introductions. First up, we've got a regular, well, really good friend to our Twitter spaces, Joseph Wang. Welcome him back as always. Headed the Fed's open desk, has an incredible book called Central Banking 101, and is the go-to guy, as always, to speak about the Fed's operations. How are you doing, Joseph? Hey, I'm doing well. Thanks so much for inviting me. It's a pleasure. Pleasure as always to have you, Joseph. Thank you. Next, we've got Jem Carson, the incumbent Jam Croissant here on Twitter, a volatility expert, founder of Kai Volatility, which you should all be subscribed to, an incredibly passionate educator in the options vol and flow space, as well as one of the best traders in it. Welcome, Jem. Thank you guys for having me. Uh, this is a big one. Uh, looking forward to kind of diving in here with a, with a great panel. Uh, if you want to find us, we're at kaivolatility.com. Uh, you can subscribe to our newsletter there, uh, as well as any other media. Look forward to the conference. Thank you much, Jim. Thanks for being here. Next, we've got Mr. Blonde Macro, an excellent writer who unabashedly gives his opinion where he can. He's most likely one of the best writers for a free Substack and actively shows his trade ideas in real time. So subscribe to his Substack now, folks. What's up, Mr. Blonde? What's up, Whale? Thanks for having me back. Thanks for coming back, man. Always a pleasure. Michael Cow up next, the Chief Investment Officer and Portfolio Manager of Cow Family Office, having worked previously at Acanthos Capital Management. He's an expert in commodities, index arbitrage, and dynamic hedging. Michael. Thanks, guys. And once again, I'm looking forward to analyzing the tread depth of the, uh, of the bulldozer that's oncoming. Yes, sir. Excited to get all these points. What were you going to say there, Jeff? Oh, no, that's uh, me too. It's, it's right in front of us. Yeah, I think this is going to be an exciting one. I'm excited to hear about this. We will be joined in a bit as well by our friend Macro Alf and Michael Guyette, as well as possibly our man Doomberg will be joining in the next 20. So to start us off here, I want to jump in with a bit of a summary. Many have suggested the Fed must pivot. The U.S. dollar's too strong, destroying the trade terms for our allies. The 310 curve has inverted, which is a Fed favorite indicator here, and GDP was up at 2.6% last week. Unemployment is still reportedly too low, and inflation has remained entrenched above expectations. So, Joseph, we'll start with you and then kick this to the panel. Where is the Fed currently in its battle here, Joseph? I think I think the the question on people's minds is not so much what we'll do today because that's very well telegraphed. We're going to do 75 basis points. I think what we want to listen to at the press conference is what the trajectory will be going forward. Now there are two narratives here, and both use the label pivot. So we have to be careful when we think about this. One is pivot in the sense of stepping down the pace from 75 to something lower, maybe 50 or 25. And the second pivot, as in the terminal rate coming down, that is to say the ultimate level the Fed is going to hike to, where is it going to be? So for some context, I think we should keep in mind that the Fed has been hiking 75 for some time now. And just a year ago, the Fed was doing 25. Well, just a year ago, people were used to the Fed doing 25 and would have been surprised if they did more. So 75 is historically very aggressive, so it wouldn't be as surprising for the Fed to eventually uh, slow down its pace to 50, as I think many in the market suggest for December and maybe a little bit less early next year. So I think that's the expectation in the market. What would be really impactful, I think, to asset prices is how high the Fed terminal rate ultimately will be. The market seems to suggest around 5% right now. I think that is really what I'm focusing on today, to see how Chirp File perceives his progress against inflation, whether or not he's going to just 
maybe pause here for a bit and see how rate hikes are feeding into the economy before. Uh, I'm sorry, I mean, pause as in go get to 5% and then what? Take a look around. Perfect. Thank you, Joseph. So, Jem, to you, PIIE has stated that the last time the Fed fell this far behind on the curve <clears throat> on inflation was 1975, and it took eight years to get it under control. Many Fed speakers have further stated that they don't expect rate cuts in 2023. If we look at the new Fed dot plots, we expect rate heights up until the end of 2023 with a reversal in 2024. What would we want to see in the new dot plots this term, Jim? What would a what would a surprise dot plot for the market here? Look, um, in in the short term, uh, you know everybody is is focused on uh, this pause, this pivot. Um, I think you could have seen this likely pause coming uh, nine months away. Uh, I don't think it's a coincidence. It sits right here before the midterm. That's not a conspiracy thing. That's just the Fed does not want to be, um, you know, uh, making big moves uh, into the midterms. They want. Uh, I'm sure they're getting some pressure uh, to to be un, quote unquote unbiased uh, and to not be continue to be aggressive into this point. Uh, there, there's data that supports a argument to pause separately. Um, uh, but but there's uh, you know the if if we think the Fed is completely independent, uh, you're you're kidding yourself. Uh, Fed policy is affected by the goings on in the macro world and what government does. They're in, they are in in communication. There is some level of independence, but I, I would be surprised if this is a, a full coincidence. I do think we should expect some type of pause here. Uh, it also makes general sense. Uh, most economists are calling for a need to to stop and uh, look around and see what the lagging effects are of what we're doing. That said, I think that's a mistake. Um, uh, you know, we, and, and several other people, uh, uh, Larry Summers came out, uh, you know, said something uh, similar. Um, I think all the signs are there that structural inflation is actually getting uh, worse despite cyclical inflation slowing. Um, I think the pause, uh, you know, given how far behind the curve is, the pause that we are about to, I believe, see, um, is is only going to make them more behind the curve. So I don't know if I answer your question directly in terms of what we need to see on the dot plots, but I think um, you know I, I think we are um, you know if anything going to make this recession shallower and make inflation structurally worse by pausing at the current uh, moment. That said, um, I, I think this structural inflation, as you've heard me talk about before, is uh, is 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 going to be here. Uh, regardless of, of what we what the Fed does here. So it's it's all a bit of kabuki theater. Beautiful. Thank you, Jem, as always. Does anybody on the panel have any comments here on those first two points by Jem before I move to the next question? Uh, I'd like to make a couple comments about about this. So I, I have three. Thank. By the way, thank you for having me. I know I wasn't signed up for this space, so this is kind of impromptu. But um, uh, I have three main points to make. Um, the first is... I think there's a big trade-off uh, between the level of the of the terminal Fed funds rate and the duration and the amount of time that the Fed needs to keep it there. So I think the the common argument um, that uh, you know the you know the, uh, the the folks that say you know the Fed you know can't keep you know can't have rates this high because of our you know, interest, um, you know, debt service payments and entitlements, et cetera. I think the problem with that argument is that it extrapolates out ad infinitum, right? So I argue that, you know, the if you want to look at boundary conditions, um, how long would it take for a 10% Fed funds rate to uh, squelch inflation? I would argue probably not very long. Uh, so, so the question I think is there is a direct trade-off between the level of of uh, terminal Fed funds rate and the amount of time it's going to take. And to Jem's point, I agree that there is a structural inflation, and if they actually um, pause at say four and a half, let's say, right, I think they will find that um, six months down the line. Um, 
inflation will not be where they need it to be. Um, I actually think that oil, I've been saying now that I think that um, what we're faced, faced with this decade is this sort of tag team between core and energy components. But in the, you know, sometimes it's going to be asynchronous and sometimes it's going to be synchronous. Um, in the short term, uh, just given developments between OPEC Plus and the, the, the uh, upcoming uh, EU embargo hitting in December, um, I, I happen to think that um, you're going to see resurgent energy inflation at a time before core inflation even starts cooling down. Um, so that'll be very, very interesting. And then the last comment I want to make with respect to the level of the dollar, uh, I've been reading quite, uh, reading up quite a bit about, about, um, about this. And it's just noticeable, not notable that in the past, when you had the Plaza Accords in 1985, and then the more recent, but not as well known Shanghai Accords in 2016, in both instances, um, it was the United States that basically um, led, I guess, this coalition to weaken the dollar. Okay, the the difference this time around, I would say, is that there. I think that there are geopolitical reasons for the United States to want a strong dollar. Um, so I don't see. And and the other thing is that at least uh, I don't. I don't. Rem I have to take a look at where the DXY was in 2016. But at least in 1985, the DXY equivalent hit 165 before um, the, the United States deemed it too strong to actually intervene. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Michael. Michael Gayed, thank you so much for coming. I see your hand there. You got a comment there as well? I just want to comment that I love Michael Cow's new uh, Twitter profile picture. I love the color coordination. I love the, the it's very put together. Uh, I'm a big fan of Mike's and and uh, Jim and, and and Joseph here. Um, uh, so just real quick to, to Jim's point, and maybe Jim, we can kind of go back and forth a little bit on this, because um, I saw somebody quote you say that um, you know a pause would make structural inflation worse. I'll take a little bit of a contrarian stance on that. Um, this is separate from the market, but it's my belief that a lot of the reason why you have structural inflation is because you have structural oligopolies, right? That you don't really have competition to bring down prices, and you can't really get competition. Uh, in place if the cost of capital is, is too high, right? So uh, oddly enough, I can make an argument that the Fed could actually make that structural inflation worse if they jam rates so high to the point that they cause all these zombie companies, which are still creating products and, and providing services, to go under, right? Which may be, by the way, why small caps are starting to outperform because there's a sense that that's not going to happen. Uh, but I think it's it, – my point is that I think this discussion around structural inflation gets to be complicated when you factor in – the role of interest rates and entrepreneurialism to then counter higher prices that are being largely controlled by just a few entities. Yeah. I mean, my, Michael, usually I would, uh, yeah, I, I, that's, that's probably been my argument for some time as well. I, I do. I'd love to, I wish there was more fireworks here, but I, I, I tend to agree with that. Uh, you know, there's this concept of, uh, that I put up with planet Palo Alto. We've been sending money to planet Palo Alto. Palo Alto. We've been, uh, monetary policy has been deflationary, right? By sending it structurally, by sending money to corporations, we've uh, promoted globalization and, and uh, technological development, and uh, you know a number of other things that that ultimately are deflationary by taking money away from capital markets. So we're actually reducing supply, and we're we're doing fiscal policy. So I, I tend to agree with you a structurally longer, longer term. So it's, it's a matter of of looking at different time frames. Uh, that that uh, the Fed actually, um, you know, uh, increasing interest rates dramatically, uh, you know, uh, is is likely to exacerbate long term inflation. That said, you know, there's a there's a medium term, there's a short term. Uh, clearly, cyclically in the short term, uh, you know, cranking up uh, interest rates is going to uh, create, uh, you know, uh, you know, short term uh, deflationary pressures. Uh, by reducing, uh, you know, uh, demand in certain ways. And and if they go far enough, uh, we can create malinvestment uh, kind of uh, liquidation, right, and create a liquidity crisis, which can then have longer term um, effects, you know, more medium term effects as well. So it's it's really nuanced. It's a, it's a function of levels. I tend to agree with you. Like I said, it's, at the end of the day, it's all kabuki theater. There's there's structural things at play here that are much bigger, much longer cycle than than what is the demand today, tomorrow, uh, they're, they're a function of, of a rebalancing, um, you know, again, any, um, you know, a rebalancing of, of populism, as I've discussed, a rebalancing sending money to people, 
and the demands that are coming from a different political class now that's come to age in the millennials on down. Um, so, but, but that's, that's kind of my broad view. So Jim just mentioned fireworks there. So I think let's see if we can try to set some off. Michael Gayet, I don't think there is a better person for this question, given your bull case. So I'll start this with you. And then I want to get Mr. Blonde in here after as well for his look on equities. But to you, Mikey G, first, Larry McDonald expects the Federal Reserve to become concerned enough about the market's reaction to its monetary tightening to, quote, back away over the next three weeks. Currently, nearly every major analyst expects a 75 bips increase with CME Fed watch at 88% chance of that 75 increase. So Michael, is there an outlook on the rate increase that is bullish, bearish, or supports the pivot? Could you explain your famous bull case here, Michael G? Yeah, no. Okay. So let me give some, some context for the audience and, and make it clear. I, I'm a portfolio manager. I run three funds. They're rules-based. They've all gotten, as I've said publicly, many times over, very badly hit, not because the signals have been wrong, but because the expression of risk off long duration treasuries is what failed this year, because rather than being the source of uh, uh, the beneficiary of stock market stress, I'd argue that what's happened with government bonds has been uh, really the, the, the that, rather that's been the source of market stress, not the beneficiary, so to speak. Okay, so October 2nd, I was looking at the bond market. I was looking at the uh, breakdown in utilities, which typically occurs in advance of a risk on move. And I put a tweet out October 2nd saying the end of the world is at hand. That's why stocks are about to have a melt up. Got a lot of hatred around that. Um, seems to be so far somewhat of a right argument because aside from the fact that sentiment is so wildly dark, aside from the fact that everyone is convinced it's going to be the end of the world, people really don't, I think, fully appreciate uh, what has happened when it comes to long duration treasuries, the hell that I've talked about many times before, which is that if you were to extrapolate out the speed with which yields were rising prior to their peaking on the 30 year uh, a couple weeks ago, you probably would have had 30 year mortgage rates at 20 percent. I mean, you were entering a period where the free fall in treasury prices, the spike in yield, had it not stopped, there would have been like a system reset. Right. So, and I've said that many times. I did a CPA presentation in Virginia making that argument. Okay. Now, I think the capitulation that stock market investors have been looking for already happened in the bond market. Okay. Meaning if you were to look at a chart very simply of TLT and you didn't know that that was long duration treasuries, you would have said that a couple of weeks ago was capitulation given the way the bar collapsed and now you're having rebound. So if you cut off the volatility in the bond market, that's enough to cause some kind of a move higher in equities, a relief rally. I'm not saying new highs. I'm not saying anything except other uh, just that, that you have to cut off this sort of system reset risk. Coinciding with that, the dollar doesn't seemingly want to keep on moving higher, at least short term. You can argue that cuts off some of the sovereign debt crisis tail risk, which has been looming for a while. And – for everybody that's here that's that's listening to this whole melt-up thing that I keep being loud on on Twitter about, it's not me just saying this haphazardly. Utilities, although they've been improving, admittedly the last you know, several days, uh, are weak. That's consistent with risk-on conditions going back to 1926. Lumber to gold, which had been weak all year, which is risk-off, stabilizing, looking like it wants to turn. Again, a little bit weak here, but uh, you know all the, all the metrics from a quantitative perspective that tell you about volatility dynamics changing are confirming that you're in a risk-on environment. Never mind all that. You're in the best six-month period, November to April. Credit to uh, Jeffrey Hirsch, Stock Traders Almanac. When you're in a midterm year, the November to April period tends to be the best six months of the entire presidential cycle. So I know everyone always wants to focus on what's the call. Okay, And I always go back to conditions dictate the probabilities. Probabilities dictate the outcome. The conditions are all there for a continuation of some kind of a bullish move before – Ultimately, maybe things go lower again. The, the, the thing that I think that's underappreciated is that uh, I'm going to argue that FOMO is far more powerful than the Fed. Okay, So no matter what the Fed does here, if all these dynamics internally within the market keep on holding, if small caps keep on outperforming, yes, they're weak today, but the breadth has been obviously expanding, which makes this different than the June-August run higher, combined with, again, tremendous bearish sentiment and seasonality, it just seems to me like you can have a continuation higher, again, for a trade. Now, the damage is done. 
you're going to have, you know, this uh, slowdown recession is going to accelerate or at some point next year. And my hope is that if that happens, you get back to your classic risk on risk off dynamic where stocks go down, treasury prices run, yields drop. Um, but I do think that, um, as I always say, path matters more than prediction. Um, regardless of what the Fed does, there's enough things happening beneath the surface that it makes sense, uh, even outside of the quantitative work that I do, to con- actually consider being contrarian, again, for a moment, which could be that, that melt-up I've been saying since October 2nd. So before we deep dive into Michael Gayed's full points here, Mr. Blonde, given what Michael said, you've said that the so-called bear bounce in October likely has a little more to go, but expect more two-way risk and an eventual fade. Could you explain that a bit and maybe give a few thoughts on what other panelists have said? Yeah, so look, I mean, I, I you know, my, my view was from um you know, a few days before, you know, Michael's tweet or whatever, September 30th, I wrote a note and said the conditions were in place for a bear market bounce, which was predominantly technical in nature and a function of sentiment positioning. Um, and, you know, look, I mean, you know, typically the way that it works is after the fact and after the market moves, we come up with a storyline to support you know, the move in price. And in this case, it's some combination of the Fed's going to pivot and all this other stuff, I, most of which um, I don't really see priced in, in other markets. I don't I don't really see the, the market suggesting that the Fed's going to pivot uh, in rates. Um, so I think that's more of a, a story that people are telling themselves rather than something that's a genuine um, quantitatively proved uh, narrative. I think when we look at the month of October, um, the 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 driver of you know quote unquote risk rally was a, a function of a, of a few things. Obviously, the preconditions that I already mentioned, sentiment and positioning coming in, and the fact that we sold off you know something like fifteen percent over six weeks um, before that, so we're pretty deeply oversold. Uh, one of the things I like to look at and that I included in the original note was you know how far away you are from a uh, fifty day moving average. Uh, and you know on September thirtieth, we we're you know three sigma below. 50 day moving average, which if you look at a handful, you can only see a handful of times over the last 40 years where we've been lower. Um, All of those cases were, you know, some kind of uh, market crash, right? Whether it be 87 or, you know, what happened at Lehman. Um, You know, if you think back to September 30th, that weekend, everybody was worried about CSFB being another version of Lehman, which turned out not to be the case on Monday. And subsequently, the market rallied pretty hard on that Monday, Tuesday, because that uh, concern didn't pan out. Uh, and then the risk or the concern you know, navigated and moved to sort of UK government and UK pension funds. Uh, and that was the big you know, to do about you know, what was going to drive markets lower. Uh, you know, as that dissipated and didn't pan, pan out, then we sort of you know, we ran over another concern. Um, and you know, we, you know, tip, sort of somewhat typical you know, in earnings season. I mean, I think the micro stories are generally better than the macro story. Uh, and that you know, proved to be a source of um, you know, quote unquote relief. Uh, and helping to drive markets higher. So, look, I, I, I don't, I don't know about, um, you know, some of the other, you know, points that were made about secular inflation and and you know and things of that nature. I, I, I tend to, you know, probably have a shorter term cyclical, you know, view of things because um, I'm not smart enough to know where we'll be ten years from now. But I think, um, you know, markets, you, know, you know, what, what are we like, you know, nine to ten percent from where we were in late September. When I look at historical, you know, bear market rallies, you know, that kind of, you know, means that we've sort of met the minimum criteria, both in time and magnitude uh, of the rally. Um, early October, I kind of, you know, threw out the idea that we could trade to sort of 4,000, you know, on S&P, which sort of, you know, we're, 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 we're close to. Um, and obviously, we now have an FOMC event that, you know, can naturally represent, um, you know, a point in time that that changes, uh, you know, the the narrative that's been in place over the last couple of weeks. So I, I just I think the risk reward, you know, from here is not nearly as attractive as it was a few weeks ago. Could certainly, uh, you know, have a chance to run a little higher. But my guess would be, um, my guess would be that you know the the bulk of the bear market rally is over. Um, totally hear you on seasonality. I, I think it's probably important to kind of go back and. And look at, at how that played out in other periods when the Fed was hiking, and you had um, you know negative earnings revision cycle that we have today. Because my guess is that um, th- those conditions you know will prove to be more powerful in the context of um, of, of market performance uh, more so than than um, 
you know, midterm elections. I mean, I guess uh, the midterm election thing does bring, you know, if I, if I can ask a question, it's for, for it's for Chad. I mean, you know, he mentioned politics. And I mean, I think one of the things that you know, could come out of next week is, you know, Republicans take um, pretty, you know, pretty meaningful, you know, amount of seats back in the House and Senate, which I think does kind of put to rest the idea that we're going to have, you know, more fiscal policy, you know, or more fiscal stimulus. Uh, in my view, that's something that maybe actually changes the narrative a little bit on on fixed income and the long end, and that that threat from, you know, government spending uh, is put to rest for a while. Yeah, um, yeah. I, oh, sorry. Yeah, 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 go ahead. I, I just was sort of interested yeah, yeah. in how that how so, that plays into the the view. Yeah, no, I I think uh, the 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 broad view that so I have two things I want to say here, both to address your question. Uh, I, I think the broad view that that it matters whether Republicans. You know, that narrative, whether it matters, whether we'll get fiscal policy, more fiscal policy or not with Republicans is 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 yeah. irrelevant. I think the populace that both sides are appealing to, whether you're, you know, whether it's Donald Trump or Bernie Sanders, they're both populists. They're both subject to uh, the voters of today, uh, which we may, we may think are different, but fiscally they want the same things. Whether it's rusted out cities in middle America, white voters, and, uh, poor white males in West Virginia or or urban voters in Chicago, right? Like we're, we're the, both people want, the, both entities want more. Now, the, 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 we saw this with Nixon in the 70s. He was the most laissez-faire Republican candidate you could possibly expect. And he actually did more than LBJ did in terms of fiscal policy. He did price controls. He did, uh, you know, uh, extension of social security. Um, a lot of things that you would not, you know, that, that are ultimately, you know, fiscal responses. And what, what we're likely to see more things like that that uh, they'll, they'll name them inflation protection acts they'll they'll paint them as different things uh they won't you won't the, the public won't see them as fiscal but they, they will be fiscal uh, policy responses so i don't think that matters um separately i just want to address one thing in terms of uh, both michael Gaed and, and mr blonde both said in terms of the current move i think it's important to put a um, the, from my ball perspective to understand why seasonality during this time is important and, and why these midterm events are important. These election events are important if from the from the basis of, of uh, understanding how vol markets and broadly market structure matters. People think seasonality is some magical construct. People think these midterm elections have positive responses because of policy changes or et cetera. For the most part, that's not true. For the most part, seasonality uh, to a major extent is a function of less time, more holidays, less volume. Um, that accelerates uh, the, the kind of charm and bona flows, the underlying risk premium flows decay, uh, and that accelerates buyback in the face of low liquidity. That is historically why seasonality exists during these periods during the holiday seasons, the, the term never short a dull market. That comes from a function of daily buyback that has to happen as a function of risk premium decay. That is market structure. That accelerates during periods of holidays and the back half of the year. On top of that, midterm uh, you know, elections, uh, we have an implied vol uh, that is significant implied vol uh, that, that is priced into this period uh, with the Fed, unemployment, uh, the elections, CPI. They're all coming up in this in this week and a half window, and there's significant implied vol uh, premium that was priced in this period. As that event vol passes, we see positive tendency positive flows as a function of skew uh, in the marketplace, and that. That we have seen during Brexit, despite the worst case outcome, right? We saw in 2016, despite what people perceived as the worst case outcome. Uh, we saw in 2020 with a contest election. We got a contest election. We had a vent ball. Guess what? All three of those, the market rallied strong into. Now, skew is a bit, uh, is definitely flatter than it usually is. So these bond and term effect, effects are, are a bit lower than usual, but we still have risk premium to the downside markets. And, and that should lead to incremental uh, flows during these periods. And, and those, are, those are reasons why structurally, we're in a more supportive period and people have front run that to an extent. That's part of what we've seen here, as well as that Fed pause slash pivot that's likely to come also as a function of the midterm sitting out there, as I mentioned. So those are reasons why structurally both of you guys are probably right in the short term. There, there is a there's a structural support in this market. But on the back end of that, these are all structural, as Mr. Blonde mentions. And, uh, you know, uh, they are likely to fade sometime late in the year or early, more likely early next year. Okay, real quick, because I yeah, think the structural, just real quick on this, I'll throw a stat out, which I, I really do believe this is also something that's being missed in, in, in thinking about the conditions, right? So there's a structural, there's also the behavioral, right? So one of the things that I've kept on hammering is 
seeing the stocks and bonds fall is very different than seeing how they interact together in high volatility sequences for equities. One of the things which is really remarkable about this year is not just the fact that risk off treasuries performed worse in an equity drawdown than risk on stocks, but also that the way stocks behaved as a standalone is very much anomalous. If you take a look at the number of weeks that the S&P 500 has lost money as a percentage of the year, you're at around 63%. The only other, uh, the only other time in history where you had that number of weeks read for the S&P was 1931. Last I checked, we're not in a depression. Now, I say that because from a behavioral perspective, markets are very good at breaking the illusion of consistency. The illusion of consistency. The, I've made this point before. The fact that the way that this decline has happened has been so unrelenting in terms of the number of weeks of the year, I'd argue, has conditioned people to be bearish. right? And that's a really important thing from a behavioral perspective, which is why I say this is largely all recency bias, we all know that expression, right? Elevator up, uh, sorry, staircase up, elevator down, right? That markets tend to go up gradually, but then when they break, they break down hard. The same logic should apply the other way around too. In this case, it's been staircase down. I, I think people are underestimating the behavioral belief that we keep going lower in the way that we've gone lower, that the market could surprise everybody with the exact opposite, very compressed move higher, at least for a moment in time. Okay, Michael. So it's true. the The breadth of this sell off has been persistent. Um, that that's for sure. I, I guess. Um, I, but I, I guess, like, I would say that, like, we started the year with you know S and P trading at like twenty two, twenty three times forward P E, right? Like, I mean, obviously, like, you have to you kind of also have to kind of evaluate the the set of conditions that were in place before this year started, uh, and by most measures. S&P 500, which is the benchmark that we're, we're talking about, was acting like long duration, not just last year, uh, you know, with 30 year real rates at minus 50 basis points to start the year, uh, but was acting like duration for much of the previous the five years that preceded that. So, I mean, I think part of the, the problem, the challenge and then obviously and I, and I wrote about this and I'm, I'm sure other people have as well. When you go back and you look at Fed rate hike cycles, it's not at all uncommon for equities and obviously fixed income as a result of the, um, you know, what the, dri uh, the driver is to perform poorly in an environment where the Fed is hiking rates fast. And so um, I'm not sure that what happened this year, the, the persistence of it and the magnitude of it certainly um, are a little um, surprising or shocking relative to the environment that we've lived in in the previous 10 to 15 years. But when you look at a longer period of history, um, I think it's less surprising when you when you think about what you know kind of what took place. So I, look, obviously, I think we would all agree that the Fed had a choice to go early and slow in its policy tightening um, or you know removal of accommodation, and we can debate exactly when they should have started. I happen to think that they should have started in the first quarter of 2021 after the vaccines were uh, provided and announced, and market conditions were clearly in a better place than than they thought they would have been at that time. But they chose not to, uh, and instead they chose late and fast. Uh, and when you go late and fast, there's a, it's the, you know back to the old cost benefit analysis, right? I mean, there's a cost associated with going late and fast. When you go late and fast, you don't have the luxury of of doing things at a measured pace, right? I mean, you have to you know you're, you're playing catch up, um, you know, for uh, and and making up for you know a prior mistake, so to speak. Um, and so I, I guess I'm not that surprised that we we've, we've had a 25 percent correction and fixed income has traded poorly. Um, but, you know, as a result of where we started. So I, I don't think it's really about like, you know, this being like the Great Depression. I mean, th those were di like th those were different, you know, um, set of conditions that drove that, you know, that sell off. And, that you know, so it's just a different style. But I'm not sure when we look back over the last 18 months that it's um, that it's that it's that um, out of kilter with other you know, periods of time that have been that we've experienced, particularly when the Fed has been the, you know, kind of primary driver and actor uh, yeah, in I, I, liquidity I don't reduction. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add a quick stop. I mean, so, so I, I think we're, we're talking about slightly different things. The, the, the S&P path has nothing to do with the bonds side, right? Just in terms of the number of weeks lower, right? As a percentage of the year, again, going back to 1931, you've never had a single year where you had that many red weeks in the stock market as a standalone. That alone, separate from the bond market, is a whole different issue, right? The, the point about the, I'm going to keep, countering that, that narrative around treasuries and equities in particular, because I, I keep showing that data. 
you've had plenty of cycles where the Fed's hiking rates, but in high volatility drawdowns for equities, treasuries are still either up or down less during that moment in time. But never mind that. In terms of the equity movement, the only thing I'm going to stress here is from a behavioral perspective, the declines have been abnormally consistent. That to me is what makes it, I think, from a contrarian perspective for a trade, an argument that you could actually go higher because, again, I go back to markets are very good at breaking the illusion of consistency, which this path downward in stocks as a standalone clearly has manifested in. Okay, one thing on bonds, though, just to be clear, when you look at history, I'm assuming you're using total return, which is fine. Yes. But when, what, but, yeah, but, it, but it's not inconsistent if you look at price return. And so the difference is the starting level of rates today yeah, yeah, were at one, like 1%. So there was no coupon, right, yeah, to, to save you. So, but so I'm just saying, like, price return was the same. So when you think about the valuation profile and starting point, the price declines in the 30 year bond are actually not abnormal. They did occur in the past. The difference is you had 10% coupon to offset you know, a big chunk of that uh, price decline. Yeah, so, no, hey, I, I, again, I don't assume they're, they're plenty of junk for the long a bit here as well. So I see, Michael Cow, you've got your hand up. been very patient. Thank you very much. I'd love to get your points here as well, and then I'm going to pick up. Thanks. Um, okay, so two comments. I shared two things into the nest. Um, so I'm in the camp that I think that this is nothing but a bear market rally. And the first thing that I shared in the nest I said that I think that this is a repeat of the July intervention matrix is what I called it. And um, the the what I was referring to um, was the July experience of the yen, the, the Bank of Japan intervening in the yen for the first time when it crested, I think, 137. And I had uh, gotten a tip off from a from a. A uh, highly placed, credible source that the Bank of Japan had asked the Fed essentially for support in painting a picture in the U.S. tenure, and what you saw then was a a, a huge risk-on rally uh, in risk assets as well as the tenure, and obviously you saw that the yen went from around like 138 down to like one. 29 or something like that but it didn't last and in fact when i when that same source called me two weeks uh later and said you know what it doesn't look like that they're going to be able to hold the line they being you know this amorphous plunge protection team whether it's you know a cabal of the boj and the fed uh you you then saw the yen completely fall apart as did risk markets but what I think is interesting about this recent bear market rally is that it, too, was uh, started by a whole uh, bunch of interventions, again, with the Bank of Japan and the PBOC uh, playing front and center. And I would also argue that there's been this uh, sort of uh, benign weather element that has actually buttressed the euro that has led to the, the dollar being uh, a, a little weaker. Um, and so it, you, you also see the concomitant um, uh, compression in 10-year yields at the same time. Okay, so the second thing that I shared in the tweet is uh, is a, a little pushback to Mike Gayed's uh, point. I know that uh, you know we we disagree on on this notion, but look, I I still think you know regardless of whatever metric you want to pull, I think this is kind of an interesting chart. Um, that shows uh, the you know the average duration of these bear markets as well as the average uh, the, the magnitude of total peak to trough drawdown. So I don't think we're anywhere near uh, the ultimate bottom of this bear market. Um, and you know, so I guess you know smart people can uh, disagree, uh, obviously, and that's what makes a market. Um, but I believe uh, Alf, uh, who's up next, also shared a similar, uh, very similar graphic that illustrates this graphically. Indeed. So, Alf, you had a great tweet yesterday discussing pivots and even with that pivot in the 2000 cycle. And yet the Fed cut by 150 BPS in a few months. And yet, one, the USD appreciated by 6%. And two, equities dropped another 10%. You'd said this was not bullish. Alf, can you kind of touch on that a little bit? 
Thanks for uh, hosting these spaces, guys, by the way, before I give the answer. Very informative before events like this. Thanks, as always, for coming, Alf. It's a pleasure. So <clears throat> what I'm trying to come across with as a message is that the Fed cutting interest rates uh, very, very late in the cycle because the economy is deteriorating very fast and earnings are dropping and the labor market is weakening. And assuming we get such a, a macroeconomic setup, which was very similar to the early 2001, when back then the Fed cut 150 basis points to bring rates from above neutral back to some measure of neutral, equity market dropped 10% and the dollar appreciated an additional 6% at the very exact moment when the Fed was, quote-unquote, pivoting dovish. So a Fed pivot is not necessarily bullish risk sentiment if it coincides with a very late-in-the-cycle pivot driven by sharply dropping economic growth earnings and deteriorating labor markets. The first reaction might be the good old FOMO body memory uh, of, of the market participants, which over the last 10 years have always seen... Um, central bank net easing as a good reason why to compress risk premia and buy risk assets. Well, that has always been because those pivots have been very proactive. They've been designed in a way to make sure to support markets even before an actual strong downturn in economic growth was visible. It was always a put, basically, uh, that the central banks designed. And this time, if the pivot comes as a consequence of sharply deteriorating economic growth, there is a good chance that people might want to focus on that like they did in 2001 and still be uh, very conservative on, on risk asset allocation because unemployment rate is going up fast, because earnings are dropping, that the pivot in this case might actually not be bullish risk assets. I'm at least opening um, that concept to the broader audience on Twitter and on the newsletter I write to the idea that a pivot is not necessarily something that is bullish risk assets. Thank you, Alf. To Joseph, we spoke a lot about markets here, and we got some incredible news from the Treasury around no buybacks this year. Can you comment a bit, Joseph, on what that means? What's going on with the Treasury markets and thoughts on what panelists have said so far? Yeah, so one of, so as we've read about in the news a lot, there's a lot of instability in the Treasury market. We saw the 10-year go above 4% and seemed to be moving um, you know, it's moving a lot. If you look at the move index, which is a, it's basically like VIX for the treasury market. It's highly elevated and comparable to levels you saw in March, 2020. And so the federal sector is a little bit worried about this. And one of the tools that they can deploy to take care of this would be something called treasury buybacks. What that is, is they would be issuing new debt and using the proceeds to buy older issues of debt, uh, thereby pumping liquidity into the market. So they punted on that. They said they're still studying this. Um, if they do that, I think that's actually a pretty good for the market uh, because it brings stability and takes away tail risk. Um, going back to the points made by, first of all, you guys made really good points and I agree with a lot of what was said here. I think part of what we see in the risk rally is just more stability in, in, the, in, the, in the sovereign debt market. The sovereign debt market is the foundation off of everything is priced. And the past few days, we've seen it, you know, basically coming down a bit. So there doesn't seem to be a moment where perhaps the treasury market might implode like we saw in the UK guilt market. And that stability, I think, is really positive. Um, uh, mechanically, so I tend to look at markets from a more mechanical faction, um, perspective. So let's invest in some things like earnings, although they do matter. Um, you know, when you have the sovereign debt market, selling off like Michael mentioned throughout the year and it's been a significant scale off. Mechanically speaking, vast parts of the market, they have to rebalance. So they have to basically, um, you know, they have to sell some stocks to buy more treasuries to maintain their portfolio allocations. So I think of that as a big driver as to what's been happening in the equity market in the past few, mo few months. And now that that's stabilized, it seems like that tailwind is, that, that headwind is away. So. That's the, that stability, in my view, makes it possible for there to be this kind of trade rally. And I also really like Alf's point about the past when the Fed actually cut rates out of the market and not respond the way that we think it is. And that's a good reminder to all of us. Sometimes, you know, we have a model of how the world works and <laughs> that's it's not super accurate. Um, going forward, though, you know, again, I think today's emphasis for me is just to seeing 
whether or not we will have to go higher than what the market is priced and whether or not the Fed will stay higher for longer. Um, I think the Fed actually shares Michael Cow's view that, you know, we can have a trade-off between higher rates um, for longer rather than just having a very higher terminal rate. Uh, that certainly seems to be the perception they're giving out through their dot plot. They think that they'll raise rates about four and a half to five percent next year and just keep it there. And maybe, maybe by having a terminal rate that's not super high, but holding it out for a longer period of time, um, they can have they can achieve a soft landing. That seems to stem from the you know, PhD economist perspective of having something called a neutral rate. Um, I'm not sure if that's actually how the world works, but it doesn't. It does seem that the Fed is thinking that way. So, um, if that's the case, maybe I think maybe that's fully priced into the markets, and so we won't have as bad surprises as we've had in the past few months. Thank you, Joseph. So let's keep that rolling. Does anybody on the panel have any thoughts about stability risks? Um, anything that any panelists have said so far? I know we've touched on a lot of points here, so feel free to chime in. May I add the word on the buybacks from um, Joseph? Um, he is probably the authority in monetary plumbing, especially on FinTwit. I would like to chime in um, as I've been in the trenches as well of uh, bank treasuries and monetary plumbing myself. Uh, so on the receiving end, basically, of this monetary plumbing uh, operations that Joseph was engineering on the Fed end. Uh, so the buyback story is a very important one to track, and it's been basically postponed by at least three to six months, if you read across the lines for implementation times. So we are not going to get buybacks anytime soon between three to six months from now, which actually leaves an interesting picture ahead for uh, net liquidity, let's call it like that, or the plumbing of the system. And what I mean by that is that what we got announced for the next three to six months is that uh, the Treasury General account will rise roughly 75 to 80 billion from today's levels. Uh, rising levels of Treasury General accounts are a net drainer for liquidity for uh, the interbank system in general. We don't have major reasons why the reverse repo facility should also drop. Uh, sure, the T-bill issuance will be increased, but one thing is to increase T-bill issuance. The other is to make money market funds take money away from the reserve repo and park them into T-bills, which means those T-bills must be at attractive levels compared to the reserve repo facility. And that can be achieved by uh, the Federal Reserve doing some changes to the facility itself or changes in regulation. Um, and we, I don't think that over the next three to six months, we're going to get money out of the reserve repo facility that quickly. Uh, Treasury buyback could be a very quick way to do that, but we won't get one over the next three to six months. And the Federal Reserve will shrink its balance sheet by $95 billion a month, which uh, Chatteris Paribus drains reserves from the system. Additionally, this is something I covered and I would like to get uh, people's stake on the panel if they are uh, they want to chime in. If you are a U.S. household today, uh, you can take your money and still keep your money into a bank and you get rewarded roughly 50 basis points across the board, depending whether you are in a regional bank, you get nothing. You are in an online bank, maybe you get a bit more, but very little. Your alternative as a form of money, a liquid form of money, is to allocate into a money market fund or to buy treasuries yourself. Those rewards, those returns on these instruments, risk-free instruments, a T-bill, for example, is returning 4.5% today. So there is a ma massive um, upside reward you can get by taking your money away from the banking sector and actually allocating into another form of money, which can be a T-bill for example, or an allocation into a money market fund, which will reward you massively more than your bank deposits. Now, if households would decide to take money away from the banking sector, they would shrink bank deposits and bank reserves even faster than the normal quantitative tightening uh, and the dynamics I just discussed would already imply, which would be a pretty sizable drop in bank reserves, which, as we know, squares relatively well with risk-taking appetite from uh, from institutions. So I find these dynamics linked to what Joseph said uh, said before pretty interesting and to keep an eye on. Yeah, I, I want to add to that, and Elf described the mechanics really well, in that so the Treasury is thinking about doing a buyback, and it looks like they're not going to do it for some time, as Elf mentioned. But if they were to do a buyback, one way they could do it is by issuing shorter-term Treasuries, Treasury bills, and then using that to buy coupon treasuries 
mechanically, what that would do is that will be taking liquidity out of the reverse repo facility and shifting it back into the banking sector. And it would also be taking duration out of the market. So in a sense, it's very much mechanically similar to quantitative easing. And so that would, in my view, be unambiguously risk positive. The difference between, uh, let's say, the Treasury doing this and the Fed doing this, though, is that the, the Treasury is overtly political. The Fed, we're supposed to think of it as an independent entity, and it tries to be. Um, but you basically have this lever that's held within the executive branch where if the market got really bad, they could do something to make the market go higher. And I think that's a tempting option. And I don't know if they're going to do that, but that's an option they, they currently have. And so it's something that we should be thinking about uh, sometime going going forward in the next year. Joseph, I, if I could just ask a quick question. Um, why do you think that they would necessarily fund those uh, hypothetical buybacks with bills versus just issuing uh, on the run duration uh, duration coupons? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, there's a couple, well, there's a few reasons for this. So if you were to make it duration neutral and you just issue on the runs and use it to buy back, let's say similar maturity off the runs, that doesn't, that doesn't really work that well in my view because you know, you're going to have a larger on the run size. Eventually, that large on the run is going to become off the run. You're basically committing yourself to an ongoing buyback program. It doesn't really structurally solve the problem. Uh, the second part has to do with a lot of the benefits of issuing bills. So, if you look at a, if you look at the spread um, between on the run and off the run coupons, it's it's not that wide. But the from for, but bills though are are trading much richer than comparable let's say short date coupon. So it really makes more sense to issue bills. It's cheaper for the treasury. And of course, if you look at what's in the RRP facility, there's a lot of excess liquidity there. And going forward, if the Fed wants to continue quantitative tightening, uh, they need to make sure that the reserve levels in the banking system don't continue to drop, which they have been. And so if you were to issue bills and have them uh, fund your buybacks, you would be giving the Fed more space to continue quantitative tightening without the reserve levels of the banking system falling uh, below below a certain threshold or becoming too low, basically. And I don't know what that minimum threshold is, um, but uh, but this may, gives the Fed more time by boosting those levels. So I saw a few people trying to chime in there. So let's keep this rolling. Let's go Mr. Blonde and then Jim. Yeah, so this is kind of a question for the panel, but I mean, I guess one of the things I've been thinking about is, you know, some have mentioned that um, the economy re remains resilient or we hear about household savings and, and other aspects. Um, I mean, I, I think that one of the things that, you know, as market traders, we probably have to remember is that the bulk of financial conditions tightening didn't really start until the second quarter of this year, really kind of the tail end of the second quarter of this year. Uh, and then there was another wave of it in the third quarter of this year. Um but I guess the rule of thumb that I've always used, um, you know, and when I study, you know, FCI tightening is that it typically doesn't show up in the real economy, you know, for something like, you know, like, let's call it nine months later, plus or minus a few months. Um, and obviously, we can see in the most rate sensitive parts of the market, it's already showing up. Um, take, you know, housing as a prime example, uh, and then maybe some other, you know, kind of, um, you know, kind of non-recourse you know, type lending um, you know, practices or, or, you know, parts of the auto market or subprime auto lending. Um, and so I guess my thought is that, you know, I know that people are talking about strong labor market data and, and household spending and other, you know, um, areas of resilience. But, but I guess I'm also thinking that, you know, maybe we shouldn't really have expected it to show up in the third quarter. And it's more of a late fourth quarter, first quarter of 2023 episode. Uh, and in that sense, the idea that the Fed is thinking about um, a slower pace of hikes or potentially kind of taking a step back to sort of assess, um, you know, what's been done to date um, and, and where things are. Um, you know, while I, I don't think that we're going to hear any of that today in, in any formal way, I think, you know, Powell will probably um, stay pretty uncommittal about what they do in the future. But it does seem possible that that could be part of the fourth quarter or the first quarter backdrop, assuming you agree that the FCI tightening that we've seen has not really shown up in the real economy yet, um, just as a function of its normal lagged uh, features. Um, we certainly see it happening in, in certain parts of uh, you know, corporate profits, which again, uh, I think would ultimately lead to um, 
you know, week or economic activity in the future. But I'm just wondering if, you know, how people feel about that, if they, if they agree. I mean, some of the talk was about secular inflation forces uh, and this idea that the economy needs much higher rates um, to slow it down. But maybe we just haven't seen the effect of the rate hikes and financial conditions tightening that we've seen to date. Thank you, Jim. Did you have comments there as well? Yeah, I mean, not, not directly to that, but uh, I do think, you know, um, Joseph's points, uh, you know, about, uh, you know, the the Treasury's ability to affect um, kind of uh, liquidity uh, and, and do its own essentially, you know, soft QE uh, is critically important to understand. Uh, you know, there are political forces at work. And again, we saw this in the 60s and 70s uh, where government is is kind of opposed to what the Fed is going to be trying to do. Right. Uh if the markets get hit and the economy gets uh, dramatically slowed down, uh, that means incumbents uh, are kicked out of office. Right? That's just the, the practical nature. So we're going to see more and more battle uh, kind of uh, between uh, government and the Fed, um, especially as we enter political windows, uh, midterms, elections, other periods that are politically important for some reason or another. So I, I think that that uh, that tool is is incredibly important as you think about these things, you know, uh, during the 70s, Nixon, right, famously, uh, kind of was in Arthur Burns' ear and, you know, brought, brought Arthur Burns on and then politically swayed the, the Fed to do certain things. I, I would expect other means of that, that type of pressure, uh, maybe not as overt. Um, and so I think that tool becomes increasingly important. So I don't lose sight of, of, of that. I think I think there's something very important to what, what uh, Joseph's saying there. Um, also, I think, uh, you know, we've seen a lot of uh, tales uh, occurring in currency markets, whether it's JGBs or gilts, um, that's, uh, you know, the Fed is worried about that. Uh, the Fed is trying to make sure that liquidity is still, uh, you know, robust in the face of, of, of draining longer, you know, uh, increasing interest rates and slowing the economy. So it's a, it's a dance. And that's what, um, again, Joseph is, is really expressing here with, with some of his, uh, you know, uh, his views what the Fed is likely to do. They're going to have to maintain broad market liquidity while draining liquidity broadly for the system, from the system so they can slow the economy. So that's a, 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 a difficult dance. Uh, it is going to uh, likely involve uh, interesting moves on, on the curve, right? Uh, you know, uh, and, and, uh, and there are going to be opportunities uh, there that are significant if, if the Fed is trying to balance between those two things. So um, you know, the, the net effect might be less about what the, what's going on market uh, point blank up or down, but what, what it means uh, on relative value across the curve. So those are my kind of uh, uh, kind of soft points that I think are important to focus on, um, you know, but uh, but whether, you know, in the short term, uh, you know, getting some, uh, you know, some news on the fact that the Fed is, is likely to try and at least maintain uh, cut off the tail of liquidity is, as Joseph says, net positive regardless. Um, and I think that's what the market is partially reacting to in recent days. I do wanna make one final note here, something that people haven't talked about, which I think is important. It, Nick, the Nick Timoros kind of comments about uh, a, a pause, uh, you know, really they came out uh, right after the uh, monthly OPEX print um, uh, in October uh, on that Friday. Uh, there is a long history for anybody who's in the vol market, you know, of, of Fed communication of important information, um, particularly when they're trying to limit downside or uh, bolster liquidity on that specific time window. Uh, there's a lot of examples to go look at them. One famous one is during the 2008 financial crisis, the banning of short selling happened at that same window. Those are things that uh, the Fed knows that that is a, a window of a potential stress, a weakness in markets, and they try and uh, announce things for support. I find that interesting. That is not a conspiracy theory. That is the reality of, of what the Fed has done historically. Please feel free to go check that out. It's something interesting to think about. Beautiful. Thank you, Jim. Does anyone else in the panel have any thoughts on Mr. Blonde's question regarding QTs being relatively recent still, or any other thoughts on what other commenters have said? Joseph, saw you unmuted uh, there. Yeah, yeah. So I just want to follow up on, on Jim's point about political actors, you know, if you just recall just a few weeks ago, Biden forgave, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars of student loans. Now that's a lever that they're trying to pull. And you know what? Why don't they just forgive all of it one day? So again, these 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 political uh, influences 
as Jim mentioned, and looking back into the past, that they they matter. They probably are going to matter more going forward. Now, touching on Mr. Blunt's point, I think he makes a really good point in that, you know, as um, the Fed people are apt to say, monetary policy acts with long and variable lags. And we really just started tightening um, a few months ago. So it's very likely a lot of it hasn't shown up yet. But I think, though, there there is something to the point that the economy today is more resilient. We're starting from a stronger perspective today. Um, so, for example, looking at housing. So housing is one of the most uh, interest rate sensitive sectors of the economy. And we see mortgage rates going to 7% and we see housing slowing down precipitously. However, we also know that you know, basically everyone who bought a house in the past has like a sub 3% mortgage. So what that means is going forward, there's not a lot of people who are going to want to sell their houses. So structurally speaking, you'll have, you're going to have less supply of housing, less inventory. So even though you have less demand from higher mortgage rates, you also have less supply. So maybe you won't have house prices tanking as much. So that would be a difference from this time compared to, let's say, around the GFC. So, and not just that, but you know, savings things that many people have mentioned. Uh, we're, we are starting from a much stronger place as an economy. So um, tightening will show up eventually, but maybe we'll need more than we think simply because the economy is is relatively strong today. But that's kind of always how we start, right? I mean, you know, the, the mortgage rate dynamic and that people have 3% mortgage rates today, not eight, is sort of always the case before the Fed goes through a rate hike cycle, whatever that prevailing mortgage rate was before people had it. I, I, I totally understand what you're saying. And, and that's, that's a, a baseline assumption. I, I guess I'm just saying that this has been an exceptionally fast and the magnitude of the cycle has been exceptionally large. Uh, in a very uh, concentrated short period of time that I'm not sure that we have seen the full effects of it yet, um, not because they're not going to happen, uh, but more as a function it just takes time for it to flow through the economy. I mean, if I look at three-month rate of change in home prices, in as early as June, we were running at 6% home price growth. As of the, the latest print, we're at minus 1%. That, that rate of change in home price momentum is the sharpest decline that we've seen significantly sharper than we saw in 2008. So the speed, you know, is, you know, and, and the impact does seem to be showing up in pockets. And so while it's true that maybe people won't sell their house, um, the activity that's taking place in, in housing has come to a screeching halt, halt in, in the context of sales um, and other forms of, of transaction activity. So, you know, I do think that that will ripple through and the second and third order effects are, are uh, from that are in front of us as well as the sort of just general effects of FCI tightening that um, play out in other sectors of the economy are, um, you know, largely in front of us, um, not behind us. Um, and, but we'll see. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's an, an opinion and, you know, based on, you know, kind of how FCI typically flows through, not, you know, certainly not a fact. It could prove to be more resilient. I'm just not sure that we know the answer to that yet. Um, I, I just have two comments riffing off of what uh, both Joseph and Mr. Blond just said, uh, and Jim. The, um, this notion, this push-pull notion of this, what I call this vodka Red Bull effect, right, where you're, where the Fed on the one hand is trying to um, apply a depressant and then, you know, uh, the, you know, political elements, whether they be fiscal or, or even these like sneak uh, uh, QEs are providing a stimulant this is this is what is going to be the at the heart of how difficult and how pernicious uh this particular structural inflation will be to fight um and with respect to the um low supply in the housing market uh leading to perhaps a a more uh, benign outcome i would maybe just gently push back and say, well, you know, I, I always say the sort of inelastic supply cuts both ways because um, uh, you see that in oil uh, currently and you see that in housing. And uh, to Mr. Blonde's point, you know, the volatility um, it, that that one can expect isn't that unusual when you consider that, you know, both in both situations, you've got a an inelastic supply curve, but the demand uh, uh, curve is going to be volatile and shift up and down and cause potentially very volatile movements, both on the downside. I'm back up here. Numbers should be coming in about a minute here. Jem, do you have anything to add here to what they've said? Sorry, I'm, I'm sitting here watching the market getting ready for the numbers. <laughs> I, 
I, uh, I, I'm going to pass for, for this moment, for this second. Yes. So we'll wait for the numbers here with a little anticipation. 75. Looks like. I'm just watching the spy chart chopping around here as it likes to do. As we kind of browse over what we're seeing, feel free to comment if any. So panel with 75 bips in May of this year, Powell said that 75 bips was not even being considered. And this is, I believe the fourth time we've gotten a 75 BPS hike. So for anyone doubting, this must dictate that the Fed really is serious. So while we read over the notes here, do we have any comments or thoughts from the panelists here? Is the Fed fully serious against inflation with 75 bips? Oh, well, I just add that Nick Timoreos has a, has a great post out showing that there was an extra sentence added into the, uh, the statement. And the sentence basically hints that, yes, the Fed will continue to hike, but potentially at slower paces. So just puts a doubt to everyone who's thinking that the Fed would stop here. The Fed is telling you that they want to continue to hike, but maybe not continuing at 75 basis points a meeting, which, as I should remind everyone, is historically very high. And just a year ago, we were thinking 25, 25, and 50. Yeah, I, I think I also saw something come across, Joseph, that, that, you know, based on the conversation we just had, that they would take into account the lag effects of, of their tighten on the economy, which is you know, probably part of what, um, drives their expectation, you know, at some point to go slower, meaning presumably at some point you're going to see the impact of this, you know, four consecutive 75 basis point rate hikes in a more material way, uh, which would, which would suggest that, um, you probably dial it, dial it down a little bit. Um, even if you still want to get yourself to that 5%, um, it, it looks like they subscribe to your work. Yes, <laughs> definitely. Well, lag, so they, they're taking that into account. You're yeah, yeah that, I mean, that's just the history of how this typically, um, you know, plays out. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't always show up immediately. And some, obviously, in the more rate sensitive parts of the economy, you would expect it to, to have a more immediate effect. Uh, but then it takes time for it to, to ripple, to ripple through. It's sort of like you have an earthquake somewhere, uh, and you know, often is the time, you know, somewhere else you end up with a tsunami. Um, related to that earthquake, but was not the uh, not the source of the issue, but a consequence. No, I agree, and we, we kind of see that playing out throughout the world as well. So, for example, if you're looking to let's say Canada or the UK or Australia, they have mortgages that are variable rate, or maybe mortgages that are renewed every two to five years. So yeah. it works it works into their system much faster than it does into ours, and you see their central banks moderating in a bit whereas ours uh, keeps going because just the transmission mechanism is different. Ours takes. Michael, what are your thoughts about that secondary potentially dovish line? Is the Fed hawkish or dovish here? What are you looking for in the notes? You're, you're now. Oh, am I the only Michael left? I'm not used to that. You are the only Michael left, man. Mr. Unique up here. Yeah. So I, I don't, I don't have any comment. I haven't had a chance to read the statement. Yeah, no worries. They're still brand new here. So feel free to chime in at any time while we're still here before the presser starts. Jim, do you so, have anything to add there? Yeah, I mean, not a lot. But uh, I mean, uh, look, the 10 year, the, you know, the Dixie there, you know, both both uh, both the yield and the 10 year and, and the Dixie are, are coming off pretty good. I'm honestly surprised this market's not having based on what they're saying uh, from, from my initial read here. That, that it's not considerably higher, but I think that's a bit of a buy the rumor, sell the news effect, right? I think people, uh, and to a great extent, have front run this, what, what was expected here in the commentary and what the, the Fed has broadly communicated via uh, Tim Ross uh, and whatnot. So, um, you know, I think this is, uh, we're seeing ball coming in pretty good here uh, on, the, on the initial rally here. This is supportive in terms of policy, no doubt there. Uh, question is, uh, you know, uh, are we going to get a, a second leg higher here, given how what we're seeing in other parts of the market and, and how things are moving? Um, but, uh, uh, you know, would not surprise me to see a significant leg higher from here uh, after the commentary from from Powell. We'll see. 
Yeah, just watching these last two five minute candles on SPY, there seems to be a lot of volume pressure there. So I'm I'm curious to see what happens there as well. So Jem, could you walk us through how you would trade a vol event here given potential front running? Well, I mean, look, uh, skew is uh, incredibly flat at this point. So, you know, on this news, I think that the trade is uh, broadly to to own that tail. Um, I mean, to give you a sense, we're in the zero percentile for S and P 500 skew in history. The uh, you know where we have a uh, you know, especially in the the very short dated, the the skew is actually relative to the at the money. The the implied vols are actually lower we've we've actually never you know almost never seen that uh you know in in my 25 years at least um so so yeah i mean if you want the tail the tail is there you can fund it uh you know with with meteor options and that's probably the trade at this point given the data we already have uh you know uh you can you can uh, go premium neutral kind of one by twos and, and things along those lines to get to get the tail here if something really weird came out from powell but but this is probably not a place to go buy a bunch of all and a bunch of premium at this uh, at this moment, given the news we're seeing and the relative underperformance to the upside so far of um, of the market, given given the, the news. Thank you, uh, Jim. I remember you also mentioned the DXY with it falling quite a bit here. So, Mr. Blonde, what are your thoughts on the potential weakening of the dollar here? Yeah, I don't know. I don't think so. I mean, I, I think like the Fed talking about sort of going at a slower pace, but still hiking, I, I still think that they're, you know, one of the more hawkish central banks across the across the globe. And I would say that um, growth in the U.S. Uh, you know, continues to be more resilient and durable than growth in other parts of the world. Um, so I, I think whatever, you know, weakening we have in the do dollar will be, you know, a function of, you know, kind of more short term technicals and some positioning related stuff. And obviously looking at some cross asset, you know, type sensitivities, but I don't think there's, I don't think there's, um, I don't think there's a case for meaningful weakness in the dollar or for it to be long lasting um, in the context of uh, what, what I view as being the drivers um, and that the Fed is a driver in, in the very short term, you know, around headlines and, and positioning sentiment, but I think the bigger, more important drivers you know, have to do with um, broad macroeconomic and growth fundamentals, um, where the U.S. is still, I think, far superior to you know what's what's available elsewhere, and the carry in the U.S. is still obviously a lot higher than it is elsewhere. I 100% I agree with with Mr. Bond there. I, I think I think the secular top in the dollar won't be seen until we reach a point where other economic zones are strong enough to allow their central banks to essentially out hawk the fed or for or or for things to here at home to get so much worse than the rest of the world for us to out ease the rest of the world and i just don't see either situation happening um to me you know if the macro got so bad that would that it would cause our fed to actually pause like today and 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 not have any more future hikes those economic circumstances would probably be forcing the rest of the world's central banks to be in full-blown ease. So in that case, our, our interest rate differentials continue to widen. So yeah, I wouldn't I, run out the, uh, the dollar wrecking ball yet, just yet. I agree with both of both Mr. Bond and Michael. And just going back to the point that the transmission of monetary policy is different for each country because of the structure of the economy. So other countries don't have to be as hawkish as the Fed to have the same impact in slowing their economy. As a result, mechanically speaking, um, these interest rates or benches can continue to widen. And to be clear, the Fed actually likes to have a strong dollar. If you listen to Chair Powell talk about um, how monetary policy works, one of the things he mentions is that a stronger dollar helps him achieve his goal of having lower inflation. So it's something that the Fed welcomes. So, Joseph, I want to go on that line a little bit more here. You said recently a strong U.S. dollar doesn't mean there's a dollar shortage. Fed is hiking. Two's at 4.2%. USD should be appreciating against other FX. It's more becoming more valuable instead. So Michael mentioned that other banks need to outhawk the Fed. The Fed's willing to supply virtually unlimited U.S. dollars via its swap lines, so USD shortages are very unlikely. Is this still the same 
given a potential softening and slowdown of hikes, given the, the ECB, UK, and BOJ, can they even out-hawk the Fed? This can go to the entire panel, but let's start with Joseph here. No, they, they don't need to out-hawk the Fed because the transmission of monetary policy is much more efficient for them. When they hike, it directly flows into the, well, much more quickly it flows into the mortgage rates that their households have to pay and that significantly slows down their economy much quicker. So they don't have to out hoc um, the Fed. And this growing interest rate differential is one of the reasons why I, I agree with Mr. Bond and Michael that the dollar can continue to strengthen. Um, you know, when you talk about shortages, that that's kind of a vague thing. So I, I think many people, um, I think there's a difference between the spot price of dollar and dollar funding prices. Now, I think of having trouble bidding dollar funding is more of an issue of dollar shortage. And when you have the FX swap lines open, um, that's basically. Any comments from anyone else on the panel to what Joseph? I mean, just that, you know, I think I mentioned earlier, I think weather, believe it or not, gave uh, the ECB some some respite here. And I sorry, gave the euro some some respite. But um, should that not hold up? Uh, I agree with Joseph that, you know, it is because the monetary transmission is so much more efficient, I guess you could say, um, for for these other weaker economies. Um, what what the, that the only safety valve is that their currencies are going to continue to weaken against the dollar. Yeah, I would also uh, just echo the point that, that Joseph made on the dollar and its role in financial conditions tightening. I mean, I think that this is an important point. I mean, I, we, we tend to focus on rate hikes as it pertains to FCI tightening, but the most effective and efficient form of FCI tightening is one where it's working through multiple channels. So you don't have to have, you know, 500 basis points of rate hikes. You can have, you know, a certain amount of rate hikes plus some dollar strength, some plus some weakness in, in capital markets. Uh, and all of those things working together, I think, is a one plus one equals three equation for the Fed, rather than having to do all of the FCI tightening through one channel, which is, you know, in, in my opinion, would cause more stress and or potentially be more damaging to that particular you know, part of the market. Um, so I think dollar strength is, you know, 100 um, percent part of their um, you know, kind of toolkit, so to speak, and that there's really no against it. I also think that being having a stronger U.S. dollar is supportive of U.S. assets. I mean, because if you look at the market from the perspective of someone from, say, the U.K. or the Eurozone or Japan, I mean, they could be buying U.S. assets and making money off the FX. Uh, for example, if you are a Japanese investor and you bought the S&P earlier in the year, you would be down in the S&P, uh, you know, 20, 20 some percentage points like everyone else here in the U.S. But if you look at it in local currency terms, you would have made a lot of money from the yen depreciating massively. So all in all, you're kind of flattish for, for someone in local currency. And if you expect the dollar to continue to appreciate, you could have a lot of foreigners. And there's a lot of money outside, out of the U.S. Um, who are buying U.S. assets in part trying to make a currency play. So that's, that's supportive of just dollar dealing you. So before we move on to closing thoughts here before the presser in about 15 minutes, a lot of people have spoken about the secondary mandate of the Fed, specifically with unemployment. We've seen resilient employment despite the tech downturn and constant layoffs that we see hitting the news lines. Jem, can you give us a bit of a breakdown of the Fed's outlook on unemployment, when they will be satisfied, and how those two mandates are related? Yeah, I mean, honestly, uh, if you uh, if you think about uh, history, uh, you know, we've had uh, this moment's particularly uh, interesting as you look about at history. We've had Fed induced, uh, so we've had unemployment go above ten percent uh, five times in in uh, modern history uh, in the last hundred years. Uh, you know, uh, four of them have been caused by the Fed. Um, and, uh, you know, two of them were the popping of, uh, you know, bubbles, uh, right, that, that, that are, you know, we, we know relatively well, 1929 and, and 2000. Uh, those were not inflationary periods. They were, they were periods of excess where the Fed felt they needed to kind of take, um, you know, liquidity off the table, too, or in response to inflation. And that was during uh, the 60s and 70s, late 60s, mid 70s. 
the only one other one is COVID, and, and that I think is, is a kind of a, a short-term anomaly, which we're now aware of. So, um, you know, in any other long-term period uh, of, of raising rates where the Fed has decided they need to take on uh, a major market issue, we have seen unemployment go above 10%. We're not even close to that yet. I think this pause here is very political. I think the timing of it is is uh, really very much tied to where we are. It's also tied to some liquidity events and making sure they have an idea of how they want to handle what's going on with JGBs. I think Japan is more important than usual, given what's going on with China. Right? There's there there's a lot of other kind of tangential things going on in the short term. So I do not think everybody's thinking about this again in two dimensions. This is a, a multidimensional um, kind of move. It is a pause that is, again, somewhat uh, political, again, somewhat tactical based on other geopolitical issues. Um, I would suspect that the Fed is right back in and tightening, uh, you know, by, by the latest six months from now and, and probably sooner. Um, and so, I, you know, ultimately, I think the, the terminal place where, where unemployment will ultimately have to be to get this inflation even cyclically under control um, is really uh, significant. So Joseph, Michael, and Mr. Blonde, we haven't really spoken on unemployment at all, really. Do you have any thoughts here, given the background that Jen? I think the Fed is a one-man um, big bank for now. So... Yeah, so because they're one man, I think we really don't, they're not really going to focus on unemployment except to get it higher. Because as I mentioned, you kind of need to have higher unemployment to uh, reduce wages and to tamp down inflation. Uh, structurally speaking, though, if you look at the demographics, um, the labor force, the working force, the prime working force of the United States isn't really increasing anymore. We're kind of pretty stable now. And that has to do with the fact that uh, we have smaller families now. So structurally speaking, we just don't have as many work or, or workforce is not as growing as it used to. And so that makes it very difficult for the Fed uh, to actually hit that unemployment figure. And also why I agree with Jim and Michael that we're probably um, going to have structural inflation going forward simply because our labor force is not growing as much as it used to. I would, <clears throat> I would just um, add that I think everybody needs to really, really pay attention to what happens to oil, because to me, oil uh, was basically the first goblin to get out of Pandora's box. And, um, you know, it's, it's obviously been uh, artificially tamped down, one could argue, by uh, zero COVID policy, not to mention our own evisceration of our SPRs. Um, but I think what's going to happen in the near term uh, is that, you know, the forces uh, governing sort of supply mitigation, supply destruction are going to outweigh the forces of demand destruction. Um, that may very well change by, you know, Q1, Q2 of next year when you do see perhaps unemployment start ticking up. Um, and I, I just think it's going to be a very interesting sort of push-pull dynamic between, you know, the forces of supply uh, destruction versus demand destruction, with the Fed trying to obviously engineer the demand destruction uh, part of it. Mr. Blonde, do you have any comments on unemployment and oil, since Michael brought that up there? Um, no, I mean, I think Joseph's point is, is the right one, which is, you know, they are definitely overweighting inflation in their, um, you know, in, in the context of their mandate and sort of what happens on the unemployment side is, I think, secondary. I, I, I do think that at least in their, you know, kind of mental model, they assume that a weaker labor market will soften inflation and that, that, that um, you know, that's the academic view of it. I mean, I, I do think that there's a number of headlines and indications that the employment um, and labor market is softening. I mean, you, you see, you know, layoffs and, and work reduction, you know, headlines, um, you know, a few times a week um, from, you know, from this, you know, you know, particularly from the tech sector. I'm um, obviously, I think some of the hiring data in the Jolts um, report yesterday suggested some, some slowing pace. Um, I think that that's a good example of a, a part of the market that, um, you know, the lagged effects of FCI tightening have yet to, you know, really show up. I mean, the other thing I would say is, you know, wasn't that long ago, we all talked about how, you know, the bull market and meme stocks and, and crypto and all this other shit was keeping people from, you know, having to get a job. Well, 
uh, that's definitely not the case anymore. So, uh, you know, maybe that's a part of the market that um, slowly comes, you know, re reluctantly comes back as they realize that the government's not going to be there to cut them a check anymore. Uh, on oil, look, I, I, you know, obviously there's, you know, oil is like is the big dog and the alpha dog in the commodity space. I would just say, I mean, if I look at commodities away from oil, they all suck and wind. Base metals are all lower. Uh, CRB raw industrial commodity prices are 15% below year ago levels, which basically, you know, is like a 40, you know, near a 40 year low. Um, so, you know, oil seems to be, you know, a little bit marching to the beat of its own drum. Um, I, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert in that space, but, you know, other parts of the commodity spectrum that I think are probably more demand sensitive and, and less a function of supply or the geopolitics related with oil um, are singing or sending a slightly different message, in my opinion. Well, I, I would, at that point, I would say that there's a very big difference, in my mind at least, between uh, the notion of an OPEX commodity versus a CAPEX commodity, right? So when you think about commodities like copper, cement, steel, these I, I categorize those as CAPEX commodities that are much more pro-cyclical. Oil, as we all know, is a very um, uh, demand inelastic commodity, at least in the short term. Um, so so I, I would say that's that's the biggest that's the biggest difference. No, no, yo, I get that. I'm just saying. I mean, the, the other demand sensitive economies are, are telling you something different, uh, and I guess you know, then it's a question of at some point if that demand flows through, then you know even your inelastic demand for oil uh, takes a step back. Um, one hundred percent. Right? So that's just 100%. that's you know it's just a function of you. Know, if I look at base metals and the message there, they're not saying that um, that we're on some you know resilient sort of economic you know, reflation, you know, kind of trajectory. Um, you know, well, to, I mean, to that, to that point though, right? Like the, the tie to unemployment, I would say is critical for oil, right? I think that that's where when, when, once you see unemployment really materially start ticking up, that's where p potentially you see some real demand destruction for, mm. for oil. But um, oil, you know, you're not going to stop driving your car just because uh, housing starts are, are, are going lower necessarily, you know, sure. or, or China's property sectors and all right, folks, so here before the presser starts in about five or six minutes, I'm going to go through the panel here. Everybody, give your last closing thoughts here before we flip to the audio from the presser. And, and again, please feel free to plug anything you're working on, anything you got coming out. To everybody listening, if you came in late or feel like you missed something, this will be available later today as an Unusual Whales podcast on Apple Pod and Spotify as well as YouTube. We will be back again for another Unusual Whales Macro Space next week, so stay tuned. And, of course, follow all of the great speakers we had up here. They're the best minds that we have available to anyone, anywhere on macro and the outlook of Fed operations. Can't thank you guys enough for coming. So let's go right down the panel again before we kick over to the presser. Closing thoughts, anything to plug that you're working on. We'll start with Jem here. Yeah, uh, closing thoughts. Uh, you know, this is essentially the pause. Uh, if you look at what they changed in the in the commentary, you know, this is the the pause. You know, the reference to lag effects and waiting to stop and see it's exactly what what you, you would have wanted. Everything but equities is really strongly uh, reacting to that now. Equities are again front ran this a bit, uh, so I would expect uh, you know a a, a mild. Uh, kind of reaction today and then maybe uh and maybe even some type of weird pullback to shake logs but i think this is broadly supportive uh and and plays into our continuation uh, uh you know framework that that uh, i was talking about due to seasonal and other kind of event vol effects that are coming uh that are, that are coming in here going forward so that, that would be my takeaway uh you know that 38 20 level below in the market in the s p is, is a level to watch if that breaks then you kind of you kind of uh, step aside but otherwise i think 39 60 is the next stop on the upside and, and you got 40 60 above that if, if this thing continues to run into the uh into the weeks ahead um in terms of our stuff uh, uh kai volatility.com uh you can uh if anybody's interested in non-correlated investments, we have three hedge funds uh, that we operate. Otherwise, uh, you can sign up for our, our quarterly newsletter and our media via uh, kaivaltily.com backslash news. So uh, please reach out. And then always, as always, uh, at Jim underscore croissant. Uh, check us out uh, for, for regular updates. Thanks as always, Jim. Love having you here.
Next, we got Joseph. Anything you want to say here at closing? Anything you got to plug, man? Yeah, so just one thing. So it looks like we're going to step down on the pace of hikes. So that's one thing to keep in mind. But I think the more important thing is how high the FIB will go. So we could step down to 50 or 25, but eventually go maybe above 5%. So that's what I would be listening for. And I'd like to thank Nick and Unusual Wells for hosting me. And it's a pleasure and honor to be on the panel with Jim, Michael, and Mr. Vaughn. I hope all of you guys follow these guys. And definitely be following Joseph as well. Invaluable information and discussion every time you hear Joseph. Can't thank you enough for coming. Next, Michael Cow, anything you have to plug? Anything you want to say here before we wrap up? Um, I'll, I guess I'll just end with what I started with, which is uh, I think that the the absolute level of the of the terminal rate um, is important, but also now I think what the market really isn't uh, focused on is the is maybe the duration and how long uh, how long it will take. So if they if they actually uh, step down and come to a pause. Uh, I, you know, I could, I could see the, certainly the logic behind a knee jerk, uh, risk on, but I could also see, uh, you know, to me, it's a little bit of a crapshoot because as Jem said, a lot of it's priced in and there could be a little buy the rumor, sell the fact. So I just don't know in the near term on that. Um, uh, nothing to plug. Uh, I just want to thank you guys for including me on an ad hoc basis. And, uh, these are always great. Thanks. Thanks everybody. Hey, thanks for popping in on short notice like that. Really good discussion from you as well. It's really great to have you here, Michael. Mr. Blonde, anything you want to say in closing before we flip over to the presser? Anything you're working on you want to plug? Uh, yeah, no, I would just say I think uh, the the 75 basis point dovish hike is a is a tough one to swallow. So I'm not sure that that's the right uh, takeaway from from today's meeting. Uh, but yeah, look, I I, I think. Uh, you know, we could we could certainly run you know, run a little higher. I, I, the level I would point out, which kind of jives with you know what Jem said, is you know forty seventy five on S and P uh, represents seventeen and a half times forward EPS. Just keep in mind that's a forward EPS that's falling, and in the context of a Fed that's still hiking. So, I, in my opinion, that represents a pretty firm ceiling, uh, and kind of lines up with some other technical levels. Um, uh, and so, I would look you know still continue to look to sell rallies. Uh, and think that, um, and think that we probably, uh, we, you know, we probably ultimately, you know, end up, you know, lower, you know, from current levels, you know, six weeks from now. But you know, time will tell. You guys can find me on Twitter. You know, you, you know the handle at Mr. Blonde underscore Macro, uh, and the Substack is stuck in the middle where you know a lot of these views are are um, sketched out in more detail. Beautiful. Thank you so much for coming out. Obviously, follow everybody that's up here. Again, I can't thank them enough for being our panelists today, giving us their expertise and feedback. And I can't thank you listeners enough for tuning in. It means a lot to us to have you folks here listening as well. Thanks again, everybody. Have a good rest of your day, folks. Thank you all panelists for being here, and we'll catch you on the next one.